I'm Pat Torres. Welcome to the story. Tonight we're going to start with a story about the passage of time. Do you remember what you were doing 40 years ago? The head of Oregon's Department of Fish and Wildlife does. He was just starting at that agency and now he's preparing to move on. He's seen a lot of changes over the years as the years have rolled by. And that is our big story tonight. It's a pretty rare thing in state government for one person to serve in the same agency for multiple decades, let alone nearly 40 years. But that is what Kurt Melcher has done. The outgoing director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife started as a temp worker back in the 80s and is set to retire in a couple of months now. So environmental reporter Cale Williams sat down with him to get his take on what's changed over his time there and the biggest threats facing our wildlife and what lays ahead. My time here was, went by incredibly fast. Yeah. Kurt Melcher, the director of Oregon Fish and Wildlife. So I was still in college when I started, but. Is uh, retiring this year after a decade at the head of the agency. And there are some things he's not gonna miss. I won't miss having to carry the second phone around with me all the time. While Melcher might not be a household name, he's played an important role in a state that prides itself on its reverence for nature, its outdoorsiness, and its animals. Well, I started in 1985 as a temporary employee, so... March 31st will be Melcher's last day, and it comes nearly 40 years after he started with ODFW as a seasonal worker, doing stream surveys, sometimes even cleaning roadkill off the highways. There's a lot of good things that we've done here. So I sat down with him yeah. to ask how the agency has changed since the mid-80s, what he yes. sees as the biggest we threats facing Oregon's wildlife, and what comes after the end of a four-decade career. Well, that's, uh, that's a long... It's a long discussion. That's a 39-year discussion, but uh, yeah, I did. I started with the agency as a temporary employee, employee in 1985, August 1985, when I was still in college. He was still going to the University of Oregon at the time, but as soon as he graduated with a degree in biology, the pull of field work brought him quickly back to the agency. He loved working in some of Oregon's wildest places, getting to see the beauty of the state from the ground and from the air. But he never dreamed he'd work his way yeah. to the director's office. Okay, well, I never set out to be the director. That was never my ambition. Uh, you know, I had a good job that I enjoyed. I got to go do incredibly fun things all around the state, whether that's doing stream surveys or flying in helicopters or flying in fixed wing aircraft doing surveys, boating on all types of waters around the state from drift boats to power boats to ocean uh, trips and, and uh, just really found it to be an incredible career and an incredible place to work. The Department of Fish and Wildlife is a sprawling agency with more than a thousand employees and a yearly budget of roughly $200 million. Now that he's occupied the top role in the agency for almost a decade, yeah. I asked him how he'd grade his performance. You know, the, the stated mission of ODFW is to quote, protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. How do you think the, the agency has done living up to that mission under your leadership? Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, that's a broad mission, obviously. Uh, I'll just say that there's two aspects to that over which, over which we have much more control, and that is over the, the fish and the wildlife themselves. We have the statutory authority to manage the take of fish and wildlife. Uh, we don't have the statutory authority to manage habitat, so we have to do that through partnerships with other uh, land owners, private and or public land owners. I think uh, given the, the pressures you know, on, on fish and wildlife as it relates to habitat, I think we're doing a good job. You can look at things like uh, Oregon's position on, um, on the Columbia River hydropower system and things that we're doing to try and make things better for, uh, for fish and fish populations. But then there's, you know, there's huge issues that we don't have control over. You know, we don't have control. ODFW can't control the weather or ocean conditions or things like drought. But Melcher pointed to some species he's especially proud to have overseen the recovery of. I mean, elk were once extirpated in Oregon. You know, I could drive you right now, Kale. I could guarantee you I could take you to a place and show you elk. You know, we have a lot of elk in Oregon. Uh, similarly, bighorn sheep were extirpated in, in Oregon and in much of the West, and their populations have recovered. Um, waterfowl, classic example, you know, waterfowl po populations have been bucking the trend of other bird populations. Waterfowl populations continue to be, they continue to thrive. But in the world of wildlife, not everything has been a success story. It's much more difficult when you talk about habitat issues and how you manage habitat to benefit fish and wildlife because there is certainly competing 
um, interests as it relates to, to habitat. And there's been some very real controversies Melcher has had to contend with. He's been the head of the agency as wolves have begun repopulating Oregon, and as endangered salmon runs have continued to decline. And that's often put him in a position where he has to make decisions that aren't going to sit well with a lot of people. Yeah, it can be a challenge. I mean, hopefully, hopefully you have good relationships. I mean, so much about what we do is, you know, we can have disagreements with, with other entities, whether they be livestock producers or wildlife advocates. We can have disagreements, but hopefully have a good relationship uh, so we can have those conversations and do them constructively. You know, you gotta you gotta listen. Uh, you gotta have you gotta have balance, um, and then you gotta sometimes you gotta make you gotta make the call. You know, and you, as uh, as a director or administrator, you gotta be willing to make the decision. You can't, in my opinion, uh, you can't let some of these things languish. You just have to you have to make a decision and and uh, be willing to deal with that. Even when you know that there are going to be people who may be unhappy on both sides. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. But when I asked Melcher what he thought his biggest accomplishment was, it wasn't about wolves or salmon. It was about dollars and cents. And we track our, our revenue regularly. We track our expenditures regularly. And in 2014, at one point, we had, after, after expenses, after payroll, we had $2.69 in our account. Um, we have about $13 million per month operating budget. So to have $2.69 in your account at the end of the month is a bad, bad place to be. These days, the agency is carrying close to $60 million in cash reserves on a monthly basis. Melcher was able to right the financial ship by lobbying the legislature to raise fees for hunting tags and fishing licenses. He oversaw the purchase of their new headquarters, which saves them half a million dollars per year over the building they leased previously. He eliminated close to 50 jobs without impacting services to the public, and he cut the agency's fleet by about 75 vehicles. That gives the agency more time to focus on its mission, protecting Oregon's wildlife, instead of its finances. And wildlife in Oregon is facing a daunting future. You know, a lot of the folks that I talk to uh, tend to see climate change and development as sort of the biggest threats to fish and wildlife. Uh, I'm wondering if you share that view, and if you don't, what you do see as the biggest threats facing Oregon's fish and wildlife. No, I think uh, whoever, whoever it is that's telling you that is, is spot on. I mean, we look at, at climate change, the impact it's having on, on our cold water fishes, but also our terrestrial um, wildlife, terrestrial animals. I, I think it's, it's a huge challenge. But climate change is not a standalone issue. It dovetails with development to create an environment where some species are struggling to survive. Yeah, it's a lot of pressures, and the biggest pressures are going to be on water. And I think you see that play out, you know, just around the state in terms of uh, wells going dry and, you know, what, lack of water availability for, um, for agriculture and municipal. And Melcher feels confident, though, that the agency is well positioned for whoever fills his seat next. I asked him what advice he'd give to the next director. You've got to be pragmatic. You need to have principles, but you also need to be pragmatic and recognize that you can't you can't win every battle, and you got to decide when, when it's worth falling on your sword versus not. And he stressed the importance of seeing ODFW as not a collection of a thousand individuals, but as a unit where everyone has a role to play. I, I view this agency as an Antarctic expedition, where every team member is equally important to us achieving our mission. It doesn't matter whether you work in the mailroom, you work in accounts payable, you work in licensing, you work in a fish hatchery or, or you're a chief scientist somewhere, everybody is equally important um, to us achieving our mission. So Kale's with me now. What an interesting conversation and just the scale of change that he's seen over the years. Yeah, I mean, he started in 1985. This was the same year that the Goonies came out in theaters. I mean, he said that their vehicle fleet included things like darts and gremlins and pacers. And these are cars that maybe younger people today might not even know the <laughs> names of. Yeah, well, and also I get the sense that he's had to really be very good at negotiating to get the things that he needs. He has. He kind of alluded to it there in the story that, you know, ODFW does not have the authority to go out and get land, and that's very important for habitat conservation. So there might be situations where they know a species needs more habitat, they can't really go out and get it. And so they have to work with other state departments, landowners, whether that's state or federal. And he said that at one point, like way back in the day, 
they, these other places weren't even returning his calls. And today they have a very close working relationship. Yeah, and it's great that he's brought them up so far. And I'm sure that, you know, like some of our friends on the eastern side of the state love hunting. I grew up hunting. But then there's folks here in the cities who are like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't be killing those animals. So to still have a healthy, strong organization through that kind of turmoil is very impressive, I think. Yeah, he's really, I think, brought it a long way from the days that he mentioned where they had just a few dollars left in their bank account. They make most of their money by selling hunting licenses and fishing licenses, and it's a very robust hunting community here in Oregon. He said they've really tried to change the way that they do things so it's more friendly to hunters and fishers so they can go out there and do what they love. Yeah, okay, fascinating. Thank you, Kale. Appreciate your story. Great stuff. And now we'd love to hear your thoughts on Kale's interview. What do you think about Oregon's Department of Fish and Wildlife, especially as it prepares to move forward with new leadership? Email us, will you? The address is thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. Our number is 503-226-5090. And in case you missed Kale's other big story today, the biggest dam removal in U.S. history hit a milestone near the Oregon-California border. Four dams on the Klamath River are being taken out and crews have begun drawing down the reservoirs behind them. In one case, that meant blowing holes in the bottom of a dam. Once they're all gone, the free-flowing Klamath River will restore access to roughly 400 miles of prime salmon spawning habitat. The Klamath River was once one of the most abundant, strongest salmon rivers in the lower 48. And this has really been a movement spearheaded and led by the tribes and natural resource nonprofits like Sustainable Northwest and other community partners. Those efforts to get rid of the dams have been going on for decades. Restoration work is already underway in places where the water is going down, things like planting trees, shrubs and grass. The dam removals are expected to be finished by this fall. Coming up next on the story, Oregon's new paid leave program. It's been up and running for a few months now, and many of you have emailed us saying, you know what, it's a disaster. Delayed payments, sometimes no payments at all, and then difficulty getting someone on the phone to help figure it all out. The process is stressful to say the least. What the director of Paid Leave Oregon says about the issues when the story returns.
Oregon's new paid leave program has been in effect since September. It's been a rocky few months for a lot of people trying to use it. The program provides eligible Oregonians with up to 12 weeks of paid time off from work to deal with family, medical or safety needs. That includes things like having a new baby, having surgery, surviving domestic violence, that sort of thing. It's paid for by all workers statewide with deductions from your paycheck that creates a big pool of money to support the program. But some people have complained that they have not gotten their money in time after applying for the benefits. Some have had to wait months to get the money they're entitled to under the law. Here's a look at the Oregon Employment Department data dashboard. It shows that they have nearly 900 applications for paid leave benefits during the week of January 7th to the 13th. That's two weeks ago. But they already have more than 6,000 applications in progress. So it might be a while before they get to everybody. And right now, if you call to try and figure out what's going on with your benefits, you can expect to be on hold for hmm, something like an hour, we're told. And keep in mind, that's the average. We heard from a lot of you. Some have reported that forms that are meant to verify your identity for your benefits have gone to the wrong place. Or you've been flagged for fraud in the state's employment office. And then when some of you call to check on your claim, you're left on hold sometimes for hours. We received a letter saying that I was um, I needed more information for my claim, a claim I hadn't made. And I've not even had the right to file yet because I'm waiting on the fraud case to close. They sent a decision November 30th with a letter ID. We have canceled the decision because it was an error. We apologize for any confusion this may have caused. The program that's supposed to help you has really been the worst stressful experience, even worse than my parents' health. Paid Leave Oregon says, yes, they're aware of the issues and they've been only able to pay out about 85% of the applicants claims. And that's only the applications whose identities have been verified. As you heard, many people that we've talked with are having trouble even getting verified in the first place. The department says they're working on it. Some aspects of fraud are that we need to assist the real person in applying for an application if maybe a fraudulent person has tried to do that prior. Uh, so we have a specific team of folks who assist with those. Uh, that's something that we work together with the claimant on to resolve. But they're putting some of the blame on the applicants themselves. They say those long call wait times are because people are calling in too often. Uh, we do have call wait times that are longer than we would like them to be right now. Um, and this is largely because one of the biggest reasons people call is to just check on the status of their claim. Um, some people call every day to check on the status of their claim, and that just drives up volume. So we've really been focusing on getting our more experienced staff on resolving those claims so that people don't have to keep calling us. By the way, they tell us that some people are starting to take their leave from work, but not applying for benefits until weeks later. And they say that it'll take a few weeks for the application to be processed. They recommend applying at least 30 days ahead of your leave if you know that it's gonna happen. They say others are not responding to their identity verification letters that they send them through the mail. And some people are getting their employer's name or other information wrong on the application. Bottom line, make sure all of your documentation is accurate before you submit it and be ready for a lengthy wait. And if you're having issues with paid leave in Oregon, we'd like to know about it. Send us an email, will you? The address is thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail 503-226-5090. Coming up next on the story, we're digging for old. Instead of the Oregon Historical Society, this one time we're checking in with the National Park Service. It's because of a 29 million year old discovery that was recently made in the John Day fossil beds in Oregon. After experts took a closer look, they realized they had something they had never seen before on planet Earth. Details when the story returns.
WIS Digging for Old. Our segments usually center on something in the Oregon Historical Society's collection. But tonight, we're bucking that rule to show you a discovery from Eastern Oregon that's making big waves in the science world. Why, you ask? Well, because it's the only example of this type of fossil ever found on the face of the Earth. And oh yeah, it's 29 million years old. Let's set the stage for you. We're headed out to the John Day fossil beds. Now, you may have gone there to go to the high school and just kind of dig up fossils on your own like I did with my family. This is the same area, but different specific part, okay? These are part of the National Park Service in Eastern Oregon. The particular find was made in the Sheep Rock Unit. Here it is, you may not look like much, but this is a fossilized grasshopper egg nest. Now, a few isolated eggs were found in years past, and the best guess at the time was that they were ant eggs. But when this collection was found, experts were skeptical about the ant idea, and they brought the fossil down to the University of Oregon to take a closer look with their micro CT scanner. Guess what? That revealed the radial shape of the nest that helped determine that it was not ants at all, but grasshopper eggs, which by themselves would be a rare find. But the casing around the eggs, described as protein slurry, the grasshoppers would have made that to keep all the eggs together. That is what pushed this discovery from kind of interesting once in a lifetime to one of a kind. We've never had eggs or egg pods quite like this ever preserved. Like the egg pod itself is the first one that we have ever seen in the scientific literature worldwide, right? So that's really cool. Um, and what it kind of tells us is that this behavior goes back at least 29 million years, right? We know it's probably older than that. The oldest fossil grasshoppers are like 300 million years. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> of course, they have to have been doing that, you know, sometime between 300 million years and 30 million years ago, right? Um, but this is the first confirmed time that we've seen that structure. Um, plus, we don't know anything really about underground eggs of grasshoppers ever, right? Like, so this tells us a lot about the eggs themselves and the eggs are like the earliest that the animal's been alive, the earliest stage of its life. And now we know a little bit more about what that looked like. And we previously didn't know anything. We didn't even have confirmations that there were grasshoppers in our fossil record out here before these fossils. So yeah, pretty cool. Now, before you get concerned about a Jurassic Park situation with grasshoppers, that is not gonna happen with these because they fossilized many of the eggs are like little geodes with minerals inside and no biological material, according to Dr. Fosmo. And despite the photos making them look large, they're really very small. Uh, they're probably about mm, like four millimeters long and like by two millimeters wide, like they're not super big, right? So a little under half a centimeter, right? They're, they're pretty small. They look kind of more like, um, they look more like grains of rice or Tic Tacs. That was oftentimes my joke when I'd be out in the field. I'd be like, oh, did you guys find another Tic Tac? Okay, cool, right? The egg pod itself is only about one to two inches in diameter. This discovery though, certainly a learning moment for the story team. We didn't really know or even think about how grasshopper eggs, grasshopper eggs are laid, let alone how it happened millions of years ago. It's a common behavior. Grasshoppers will be up on the surface, the ones that do this, they'll be up on the surface and they'll stick their, their very back end of their body, like underground, maybe about an inch or so. And then they just start, you know, depositing the eggs in whatever pattern they, they do it in and they do their different layers. Um, you know, and most grasshoppers lay their eggs on leaves that we normally think of. Uh, but there is a contingency of grasshoppers and their relatives that lay their eggs underground like that. It's not very common for soft tissue to preserve at all. Um, so getting something like this in the original arrangement is like just mind blowing. But, you know, what probably helped it become a fossil is the fact that they were laid underground in the first place. Things that tend to fossilize really easy in the fossil record are things that are already underground. Um, so rodents actually have a really good fossil record uh, for a similar reason. Uh, so those are some of the, you know, all the things working against making this happen and why it has taken so long for something like this to happen. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime sort of discovery. Yeah, 
Very interesting. The individual fossilized eggs received this name in scientific speak. No, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but the second word is to honor the first National Park Service superintendent of John Day Fossil Beds National Monument, Benjamin Ladd. He's credited with protecting the John Day fossil beds, and thankfully he has because a lot of people have been out there and enjoyed them. The, he led the effort to study and preserve the area between 1975 and 1993. His legacy now enshrined in the scientific record. There is a plan to eventually put the grasshopper egg nest fossil on display for the public, but those discussions just now getting underway. Be pretty cool to see. That's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. And remember the story, our collective story? Well, that never ends. The good stuff's coming your way next. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night, 630.